this episode of The Stay We're In, as the vaping epidemic evolves in Minnesota, we bring you a preview of our upcoming video documentary, Stories from the People on the Front Lines of This Epidemic, an epidemic fueled by menthol, candy, and fruit-flavored nicotine products to keep people hooked and attract the next generation of smokers. The alarming rise of youth vaping goes hand-in-hand -hand with the insidious impact of predatory marketing the commercial tobacco industry has targeted at marginalized communities, including African Americans, American Indians, and LGBTQ people. Clearway of Minnesota has been our partner in this work for decades. Here's Laura Smith from Clearway, reflecting on the continued problems caused by big tobacco. I'm Laura Smith. I'm a senior public affairs manager at Clearway, Minnesota. Here in Minnesota, we made great progress to reduce youth cigarette smoking. Um, and we found that we've actually reached really low levels in the last couple of years. But meanwhile, uh, Big Tobacco came in and swooped in with a new uh, product to addict kids. And e-cigarettes have really led to an epidemic of addiction among youth. Um, so right now what we're seeing is one in four 11th graders in Minnesota using e-cigarettes and more than 10% of 8th graders. And that's a rate that's more, nearly doubled in the last three years among 8th graders. Nearly every e-cigarette contains nicotine, some at very high levels, and nicotine can prime young brains for addiction not only to cigarettes, but to other substances as well. So it's really concerning. This isn't the kids' fault, and it's not a coincidence. You know, this is big tobacco and uh, going after the next generation of customers. So we know from investigations into Juul, which has really driven the e-cigarette epidemic, um, that company used very sophisticated and aggressive marketing tactics that went after kids. So they did things like summer camps and went into schools and really shared misleading and sometimes completely false information about how safe these devices are. Um, so we know that they use those tactics in, in kids as young as eight years old. Um, and and not, in addition to that, they also had a very sophisticated um, social media marketing plan where they went after celebrity influencers and other youth influencers to really get the word out about Juul and, and really sell it as a fun and safe um, device for kids to use. So it's really disturbing, I think, for adults. You know, we don't see those advertisements. We don't see those marketing tools because they're not targeting us. They're targeting kids. Um, in the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey, we found that nearly 90% of middle schooler and high schoolers had seen advertising for e-cigarettes. So again, that's not something that they're targeting at 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds. They're targeting kids. It's not a mistake. Will and Claire have experienced the impact of vaping firsthand. They are courageous and generous in sharing their experiences as leaders in the fight against commercial tobacco. I'm Will. I'm 17. I'm a senior. I live in Hopkins, Minnesota. Um, of course, my whole life I had been raised, you know, cigarettes are awful. Um, Nicotine will kill you. You know, that whole movement, our generation was supposed to be the generation that ended smoking. Um, but at the time, I was in a pretty bad place. So even though I knew that this was going to be bad for me, even though I knew that it was damaging me, I didn't care. I was in a bad enough place that the risks didn't bother me. And then, of course, as I got more and more into vaping, uh, I was also told a lot of, this is a safer alternative, this is water vapor, this has less nicotine. None of which is true, first of all. <laughs> but it was a really easy way to ease my conscience, I guess. Like I knew if my parents found out they'd be mad, but in my head I could rationalize it as, this is better, you know? So yes, my first experience was with a very large vape. Um, it was part of that impressing an older, cooler friend thing. Um, it was scary, honestly. I was kind of an innocent kid. I, I had just gotten into junior high, really, so I hadn't become accustomed to the person that I was. I was finding out my identity, and then, you know, someone older, someone I looked up to, someone who I wanted to emulate, offered me this thing that at the time, of course, I thought was scary. I was a little kid, but I hit it for the first time and I coughed everywhere. And then I hit it again and I got the buzz for the first time. And I mean, that was it for me. <laughs> um, 
I, at the time and currently, have been dealing with a lot of mental health things, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. And one of the first things I noticed when I got that buzz was that pit in your stomach that anxiety gives you kind of melted away. And that was a big part of it for me for a long time, the relief from anxiety. The quitting had a huge, huge effect on my academics. Um, I mean, first it was difficult because I had to keep it a secret, but also um, when you're quitting nicotine, it is just awful. I know I'm predisposed to anxiety as it is, so one of my biggest effects of nicotine withdrawal was just intense, intense, intense anxiety. And I would have panic attack after panic attack throughout the day. I couldn't focus. I had headaches. My stomach would hurt. I was tired all the time. I was hungry all the time. It's so much worse than you expect it to be. You know, it feels like this harmless little machine that I've got in my pocket that makes me feel good. But as soon as you have to quit, you realize that it's a lot more sinister than that. And as I was quitting, my grades suffered a lot. Um, I would skip class. I threw up a couple times. Um, and even when I was in class, it's hard to focus. It's hard to focus with your body screaming at you that it needs more nicotine or your head pounding because you haven't had nicotine in 14 hours. It's a nightmare. <laughs> so that did have a big effect on my academics. I've actually quit four times now, which is kind of sad. You know, it shows how easy it is to get back into it. But yeah, I've quit four times. The first time it was just me on my own deciding that this wasn't worth it, that it was pulling me out of my life. I was in cross country running and Nordic skiing and we would have meets and the whole team would be out there having fun and I would sneak away to a porta potty to hit my vape for a couple minutes and then come back and I'd have missed the jokes and it just, it felt bad. You know, it felt like an outsider. It felt like I was doing this thing that no one else had to do and it sucked, you know? Um, and then the second time I was actually hospitalized for some mental illness things for my depression and my anxiety. And there was the first time I had ever talked to an adult about my addiction. And they were really good. They offered secession aids. I got um, nicotine gum. I got people to talk to. I was able to talk openly about why I was doing it and how it was affecting me. And when I talked to the adults, people were able to tell me that this is normal. This is nicotine withdrawal. You're not dying. You're not weird. You're not messed up permanently, you know. And that was very helpful for my quitting, just to be able to talk to people about what it was. Um, the third time was because I ran out of money. <laughs> I um, just couldn't afford it. I was going through so much at a time that just the amount of income I made as a 16-year-old boy was not conducive to my nicotine habits. And then the most recent time was actually <laughs> After I started doing these things, speaking out against nicotine, I had been trying to quit for a while. And once I had like talked to the governor and he was like, yeah, nicotine's bad, like this kid quit, right? And then I was like, ah, oh, yeah, totally. And then I had to actually quit and that was like the most pressing one and it was, it had the most shame associated with it. And shame while quitting nicotine sucks. <laughs> I talked already about the anxiety, but it just magnifies all of those negative emotions. I felt so bad about myself. I hated myself so much while I was quitting, and it was just an awful experience. <laughs>
Um, it just became like a part of my routine through sports, honestly. And it made it more like engraved into my mind that to have fun, like vaping was a part of it. Like to be in a car, to listen to music, like you're passing around a vape at the same time. Like it was kind of engraved in my head that it was a part of what like I was doing every day. And it became a part of my routine. For like the flavors that I used, um, blue raspberry was definitely a favorite, which blue raspberry isn't even a fruit. So you can't tell me that you're not advertising to kids when you're putting out a flavor that's literally in all kids' candies. Like what adult is like, my favorite flavor is blue raspberry. Like that's just not a thing. Um, I feel like, I mean, I might be that adult, but um, blue raspberry, was my personal favorite. And then like I tried, I liked menthol a lot, which definitely just adds more chemicals because menthol is just another chemical that you can add and inhale. So who knows what that was doing. Um, and I didn't fully quit until about junior year, which was this year. Um, I kind of at that point was just deciding that, you know, I was gonna use the nicotine. To me, it was like, I, I kind of thought of it as like, I always had the chance to quit later. You know, like I thought of it as like, I don't have to quit now, but I can quit later and I'm never gonna do this forever. And that's kind of what I told myself to like make myself feel better about it. I mean, I'd say like, I tried quite a couple times to stop. So I don't think it was necessarily like one time trying. I feel like for me, it was more of a mindset. Um, I think for me, it was thinking about what I want in my future and like where I want to be 10 years from now and knowing that like vaping wasn't going to be a part of my future. Like, you know, I want to be a nurse, like I want to help people and like I don't want to be dependent on a drug my whole life. And I guess that's kind of the realization that made me realize like I need to quit because like I'm stronger than this. Like I've been through so much and I've used so many unhealthy coping skills and I've kicked them out of my life. And this was just another one I had to kick out. I think that what a lot of people don't think about is that with vaping addiction comes the addiction of hitting something. It's not just about the nicotine, it's also about the mechanical like going, sucking, feeling it, it go into your lungs. like. It's a process, and for me, quitting that part was, it was part of my routine, you know, like I wake up and I hit something, like I go to, before I go to bed, I hit something, and so that was really hard to quit. But I ended up doing it, I mean, it was hard. Like I used straws for a bit. I remember like, just like taking a straw and just like pretending it was a vape and like, and like that was the most I would get, but like honestly that was enough. Yeah. Um, what I learned throughout all those times of quitting was that I needed one support. I needed someone who understood what I was going through. Because it's one thing for a parent who's never dealt with an addiction, never dealt with even a nicotine addiction. Because for me, like, I wanted someone who has dealt with a nicotine addiction because, like, I wanted them to relate fully. And I needed, like, that connection for me to pretty much, um, feel safe in quitting. So like I had my social worker at the time um, through the school, she had a cigarette addiction in her lifetime and she would give me like coping skills and strategies to quit. And for me, it wasn't necessarily about one of those cessation aids helping more than the other. I think that all of them help in some way, shape or form, but I feel like it's more about the support and it's more about getting past the mental block of like, because it really does have to come from the person to quit. Um, to help kids not start, I think the most important thing is to focus on the reasons they are starting. Um, make sure that they feel good about themselves. I know a lot of people that I know, myself included, that started vaping did it because of a mental illness, because they were escaping something. And I think to treat the disease that is addiction, we need to treat the disease that is mental illness. Um, I think it's a cause and effect thing, and when we focus on stopping kids from starting smoking, we're treating a symptom, not a cause. I think that 
If we were to make a program to help people with their nicotine addictions, I think that the number one thing that would help kids is support from adults who have experienced a nicotine addiction. I think that's something that's really powerful. I think that when a kid can feel truly connected to an adult and there isn't that age barrier and there isn't that feeling that like, oh, you're older and you haven't experienced this, like you're not in this day and age. Like if you break that barrier, I think that's really powerful. We'll dive deeper into the complexities of the vaping epidemic in our upcoming documentary on youth vaping, where we continue with these conversations. We'll also explore how vaping is impacting Native American youth from the Lower Sioux Indian community and how tribal leaders are addressing the problem. We'll learn more about the serious health impacts of vaping from Dr. Brooke Moore, a pediatric pulmonologist at Children's Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota. This episode was produced by me, Jason Dom, with editorial support from Sandy Leitner and Jenny Song. Many thanks to Will Gittler, Claire Herring, and Laura Smith, and the crew at Quiet Island Films. Funded through proceeds from Blue Cross's historic lawsuit against the commercial tobacco industry, the Center for Prevention works with organizations statewide to make healthy choices possible for all Minnesotans. By tackling the leading causes of preventable disease, commercial tobacco use, physical inactivity, and unhealthy eating, we advance health equity to transform communities and create a healthier state. Follow the Center for Prevention on Facebook to keep in touch and learn about future episodes. And for more info on this episode, please visit centerforpreventionmn.com slash podcast. That's centerforpreventionmn.com slash podcast. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota is a nonprofit independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.